This panel is entitled Revising Traditional Notions of Competition and Monopoly. And the first paper, or the first talk to be given, is called Reexamination of the Rules Against Horizontal Collusive Arrangements. And the lecturer is Dr. Mario Rizzo, received his PhD from University of Chicago. He's now a professor in the economics department at New York University. And uh, dear to many of our hearts, he's a faculty member in the Austrian economics program there. His uh, specialization is in law and economics. And uh, Mario will be a fellow in civil liberty at the Yale Law School in the spring semester this year. Mario. Thank you, Richie. Um, can everyone hear me? OK. Uh, after listening to uh, Jim Buchanan's uh, speech this morning, it was uh, clear to me that his role here was to hold up the extreme left wing position <laughs> on uh, antitrust economics. And uh, I hope to uh, uh, at least be one of the participants of this conference who will redress the balance and hold up the extreme right wing position uh, on anti, uh, antitrust. Um, I thought of calling uh, my paper an ode to collusion, but then <laughs> I thought it might be considered uh, not sufficiently scientific or uh, not sufficiently value free, so I uh, quickly dropped that idea, though if uh, um, I decide that this paper should be published, that might be a good subtitle anyway. My uh, previous work in the area of law and economics has really been in uh, torts, uh, evidence, and contracts, and other areas of law that, at least to me, make sense. Uh, this is my uh, first effort, say my virgin effort, in uh, antitrust uh, economics. And I hope that uh, uh, after I finish, uh, uh, the uh, lack of sense of antitrust will be even more evident uh, than it was before. What I want to speak to you about today is, a, as Richie said, a reexamination of the rules against horizontal collusive arrangements. Now, the, the title in the program is a little broader than that, and I don't intend to talk about vertical price restrictions because I think the economic literature uh, in that area is, is sufficiently good. We haven't been successful in convincing the courts yet, but I don't think that, the, uh, uh, that that's really the challenge. I think the challenge for economists is to debunk some of the myths that uh, have been perpetrated by the perfectly competitive model on uh, horizontal collusive arrangements, and that's what I want to address in today's talk. The market process, as I see it, is far broader than that implied by the traditional theory of competition, and especially by its formalization, the Arrow de Brew general equilibrium construct. Of course, now that construct has been uh, given a Nobel Prize, so it's even more important, I think, to combat some of its improper uh, uh, um, implications. Even those economists who claim to follow an essentially process view have often focused solely on one dimension, that is price competition. In this talk, I will emphasize the multidimensionality of the market process. In particular, I will show that specific institutional or organizational structures are extremely important in facilitating market adjustments. More importantly, and perhaps more controversially, uh, sometimes the market quite properly develops institutions whose purpose it is to modify or even repress both the free movement of prices and the independence of decision making with regard to non-price variables, such as plant expansion, division of territories, etc. From the perspective of the traditional uh, competitive uh, a model, price fixing, and other forms of horizontal cooperation are unambiguously inefficient. Indeed, the economic rationale for the per se rule against price fixing, especially in a, in a horizontal context, is that little of, redeeming, of a redeeming nature can be said in its defense. It is clear, however, that there are many areas in which the market represses the free movement of prices to apparently good effect. The most obvious example is simply a contract that specifies a fixed price over a period of time in which the spot price may fluctuate. And examples of this are employment contracts, 
uh, futures contracts in which an individual may agree to buy X units of 1984 soybeans at Y dollars, despite what happens to the spot price. The purpose of these contracts is either to shift uncertainty onto those who can bear it more cheaply or to reduce uncertainty, as in the case of futures markets. Another and perhaps more pertinent example for our purposes is that of the firm itself. Coase argued many years ago that sometimes it is inefficient to work through price relations. Here, firms, or little islands of socialism, as it were, develop in, wi uh, in, in which behavior is directed through non-price administrative means, or more generally, through cooperative behavior. There may, however, be diseconomies associated with certain forms of cooperative uh, behavior and not with other, other forms. When, for example, it is efficient to cooperate in all respects, two formally independent firms will merge. But if only partial cooperation is warranted, they may collude. Collusion, then, may be seen as a point on the continuum between outright merger and atomistic independence. If we apply a rule of reason to mergers, why not to collusion of all types? In what follows, I wish to examine two forms of collusive practices. First, those practices the object of which is to reduce uncertainty. And second, those the object of which is to compensate for deficient incentive structures and thus to reduce costs. Let me begin with collusion that reduces uncertainty. Here, I think it's important to uh, differentiate between two types of uncertainty. And I'm only speaking really about one. Um, the first type of uncertainty is perhaps the most traditional type that we think about in, in, in economics, and that's what I want to call exogenous uncertainty. That is, uncertainty with respect to the underlying data, consumer tastes, resource availability, technology, things of that sort. Sometimes trade associations arise to exchange this kind of information. Now, I think Posner and others have uh, convincingly argued that in unconcentrated markets, these exchanges of information are indeed pro-competitive. Um, while these uh, arguments, uh, Posner and others, are uh, quite interesting, this is not my primary concern here. The second form of uncertainty that I wish to discuss in greater detail is what I will call endogenous uncertainty. That is, uncertainty about what competitors will do what prices uh, they will charge, or how they will invest or disinvest in response to profit opportunities in that industry. This type of uncertainty is endogenous to the process of adjustment within certain institutional arrangements. In principle, this form of uncertainty can be eradicated or reduced by changes in the organizational setup. And this is what I want to discuss. Consider first the endogenous uncertainty with respect uh, to price. Now, I think um, uh, James Mead, who uh, in many respects uh, uses uh, this notion of uh, uncertainty with respect to price to argue uh, for essentially uh, government planning, government coordination of industry, Nevertheless, I think that many of the points that Mead raises are relevant in, the context, in, in my context, that is to say, the context of voluntary uh, price agreements. Let me quote uh, briefly from Mead's uh, book, The Controlled Economy. In it, uh, Mead says the following. The oligopolist, in his turn, has to consider not simply how his customers will react directly to a change in the prices he charges. He must also consider how his closest competitor or competitors will react in their prices, which depends, of course, upon how they think he will react to their reactions. We're in the realm of the theory of games, of bargaining, of conventional good behavior, of tacit or open collusion, and so on." End quote. Now, this is uh, very much the kind of uncertainty that Keynes described in his famous beauty contest story. Uh, where the object was to guess what average opinion thought the most uh, attractive uh, faces were in this, in this beauty contest. 
Uh, the object wasn't to, uh, to decide uh, whom the, uh, any given individual thought the most attractive people were, but rather the object was to determine what average opinion thought the most attractive people were. Uh, so the object in, in the Keynes example and in, in the Mead discussion was not to guess something that stays put or at least is independent of the guessing process, but rather uh, like taste for, or, or resource availability would be. But rather, the firms and the individuals in the Keynesian example must form expectations about the expectations of other firms. And the two are not independent of one another, as we have seen. A similar story uh, can be told about the endogenous uncertainty with respect to uh, competitive investment decisions. G.B. Richardson, in his neglected but brilliant work, Information and Investment, summarizes this phenomenon in the following way, quote, the existence of a general profit potential cannot automatically be assumed to create particular profit opportunities for individual entrepreneurs. Before any particular entrepreneur is prepared to invest in the production of the commodity, he will have to be assured that the volume of supply planned by competing producers who are also aware of the opportunity will not be so large as to overstock the market, thus converting the expectation of profit into the realization of loss. Without this assurance, entrepreneurs would not invest and supply would not be expanded. A general profit potential which is known to all and equally exploitable by all is for this reason available to no one in particular." End quote. This again is another example of the Keynesian beauty contest style of uncertainty, the endogenous uncertainty. Each fir firm must form expectations about the expectations of other firms. And once more, these two are not independent of one another. Now, on the basis of what Mead and, and, and Richardson say, uh, it might occur to you, well, how then do firms ever, in the absence of any type of explicit coordination, uh, make decisions? Now, it is true there are certain uh, factors that, ex uh, that may exist in, market, in certain market contexts that mitigate this endogenous uncertainty. Firms do not always face the pure, unadulterated form of endogenous uncertainty depicted here for several reasons that I think are important to discuss in order to see why, uh, in their absence, uh, collusive arrangements, explicit coordination might be beneficial. Some of the reasons that this endogenous uncertainty is not uh, uh, present to extreme degrees in, in a number of industries uh, can be looked at in the can be seen in the following way. In some instances where firms tend to be of uniform efficiency and where costs can be unambiguously allocated, it's a kind of ideal type, average costs can place a limit on the variance of price differences so that firms, in looking to their own average costs, to the extent that they can unambiguously allocate their costs, will see more or less the range in which they can expect, if other firms are equal efficiency, the range in which they can expect price fluctuations to take place uh, in, other, in other firms. It pr puts kind of a limit on what they can expect their competitors to do, though it doesn't by any means eliminate this form of uncertainty entirely. Organized futures markets are another instance of uh, of ensuring greater stability or greater certainty into the price structure in a particular industry. And where these exist, that will, inc that will uh, uh, um, make planning on the part of individual firms easier and less characterized by endogenous uncertainty. In addition, with respect now to, say, the issue that uh, Richardson raised with on the uh, profit opportunities, uh, the danger that, these, that, these, that in response to uh, uh, generally uh, known profit opportunities, the market might over-respond, and hence that very danger preventing people from adequately responding. Uh, that kind of situation can be uh, ameliorated where, for example, knowledge of a potential profit opportunity is not widespread. Then, in those cases, the threat of oversupply of competitive investments will be less. Similarly, where products are differentiated and consumer loyalty is high, there will be greater certainty of demand. 
Hence, firms will be less anxious about the effects of competitive increases in capacity, because the increases in capacity by for other firms in the industry will not be quite as relevant, since they can rely on their demanders, uh, their consumers, to continue to purchase from them, since uh, products are differentiated. In a sense, what all of these arguments do, uh, I might add as a footnote, is convert, um, as Richardson uh, shows, I think, very brilliantly, convert the so-called defects or frictions of the market into the very virtues of the, uh, necessary for adequate adjustment. That is to say, the absence of certain, of, of, excuse me, the presence of certain frictions, which would be absent in the perfectly competitive equilibrium, are precisely those things which prevent uh, uh, maladjustment in the competitive process, in which enable firms to plan in a way which is characterized by greater certainty of the uh, environment. Now, nevertheless, when these and other so-called frictions are not present to the requisite degree, collusion may be an effective means to reduce uncertainty. So I guess, I, in a sense, I'm viewing frictions and collusion as being alternative ways of, of adaptation. To the extent that we have a lot of frictions of the sort that I have discussed, um, collusion will be less necessary. To the extent, in some sense, that the market is more perfect, paradoxically, collusion will be more necessary. Direct coordination of prices and investment decisions will produce more social benefits as the following uh, characteristics are present. One, the more difficult it is to allocate costs say, in multi-product firms. The more difficult it is to allocate your costs, the more you really don't know what your average costs are in any precise way. And to the extent that you can assume that other firms have similar cost structures, the more you're not quite sure about what those firms will find in their interest to charge, because you yourself don't, don't exactly know what your costs are. Your costs are, in fact, uncertain. So the more uncertain your costs are, the more difficult it is to allocate your costs, as it would be in multi-product firms, uh, the more it might be necessary, uh, the more direct coordination might be beneficial because the less the unco or the un collusive market, the non-collusive market, will be able to, in, to in, uh, instill a degree of certainty. The second factor, which would make collusion uh, more, uh, uh, more likely to, to yield social benefits, is the greater the differences in efficiency among firms. In firms of differential efficiency, the more difficult it is to predict the behavior of, uh, of, of other firms, of competitive firms. The third factor, is the fewer the opportunities to engage in futures trading. We see that the presence of future mar futures markets creates a certain degree of certainty in the price structure. Obviously, the less the opportunities, the fewer the opportunities to engage in futures trading, uh, the uh, less of this certainty will be uh, in the price structure of the particular market. The fourth characteristic that makes for uh, beneficial uh, social consequences of collusion, are the more widespread the knowledge of potential profit opportunities, which in a sense, again, paradoxical, because one would think this is a, one of the characteristics of the perfectly competitive model, uh, widespread knowledge of profit opportunities, and in perfect competition, there's no collusion. But in, if you concentrate on the adjustment process, uh, the more widespread this knowledge is, the more the danger of overreaction, hence the more the need for explicit collusion to prevent this kind of uncertainty. Five, the less differentiated the product. With undifferentiated products, uh, the expansion of competitive uh, capacity will be more of a threat, and hence, again, the more the uncertainty of the environment. Six, the less marginal costs rise with an increase in the rate of capacity expansion. This means the competitive firms can increase their investment rather rapidly, hence threatening oversupply. Seven, the longer the transi transmission interval between when investments are made and competing firms find out about them. If, of course, people could find out rather rapidly what their competitors have done or intend to do uh, through other means other than explicit con collusion, um, then there would be less need for the direct coordination. And finally, eight, the greater the amount of durable and highly specific fixed equipment in an industry. If there's a lot of non-specific equipment, then, of course, there's costless exit. 
And when there's costless exit, then if you make a mistake and there's too much capacity, uh, there's an overreaction, no big deal because exit is costless. But to the extent that capacity is, is specialized and fixed and highly durable, mistakes will be more costly and hence the greater the social benefits of avoiding those mistakes through direct uh, uh, coordination. Okay, these I think are uh, a number of indicia of when uh, explicit coordination uh, tends to produce social benefits. Now the reduction of this form of endogenous uncertainty will have at least two beneficial effects. One, it will facilitate uh, more effective adjustments and coordination, and two, it will tend to increase industry output to the extent that firms exhibit risk-averse behavior. And uh, Donald Dewey in a uh, AER article of a few years ago emphasizes this, this aspect of the reduction of uncertainty could actually have an output increasing effect to the extent that firms are risk averse. Now, many of you may be thinking, well, you've mentioned all the possible good things uh, about collusion, but don't I recognize the negative aspects of collusion? Well, I do. Uh, for reasons familiar to economists, um, there does exist a tendency in collusive arrangements to raise prices beyond what they would be in under non-collusive circumstances with the identical cost structure. So the question obviously is, do the beneficial features of collusion outweigh the negative features? And there are two ways of approaching uh, this question. One way, which will be uh, uh, more uh, congenial to those who want to maintain uh, the antitrust laws, would be to say, uh, let's examine the market for the presence of these eight factors listed that I've listed. The greater their number and quantitative significance, the higher the probability, ceteris paribus, that collusion is on net beneficial. We could do some kind of uh, argument like that. And that would keep the antitrust uh, division uh, and the FTC in business because they could go around measuring these things. Uh, the second way to approach the question, which I find more congenial since I'm always looking to save uh, money uh, uh, and we could save money uh, on the FTC and the Justice Department, the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, would be to apply a market test. My contention here, which um, I'm going to have to uh, go through rather rapidly, is that if entry is free, and I, and I don't mean costless, in fact, uh, my requirement is that entry be free but not costless. That is to say, it be not blockaded by the government, uh, but at the same time not free in the costless sense. Then actual or potential competition will eliminate inefficient collusive arrangements. It will not, however, eliminate efficient collusive arrangements. My argument is as follows. If the uncertainty cost reducing features dominate, then a cartel or, let's say, organization will be Will, uh, will be a superior form uh, of, of uh, uh, institutional arrangement. The cartel will be able to outcompete non-collusive new entrants because, in effect, it, its costs will be lower. The uncertainty aspect of its costs will be lower. And, and it will then survive in the market process. Therefore, the market provides an automatic check or test on the relative efficiency of different forms of organization. Now, let me briefly uh, mention my, uh, as in way of a footnote, why I say that the requirement is that entry be free, that is to say not blockaded by government, but not costless. Uh, if entry were costless, um, then the uncertainty reducing features of cartels would be dissipated uh, and no relative efficiency test would be possible. Costless entry means that many firms could enter at once, thus making price and investment coordination amongst the cartel members impossible. Costly entry, on the other hand, implies slow entry and hence less disruption of the coordinative capacity of the cartel and hence a greater capacity for the market to test, in effect, the, uh, uh, the balance of cost reducing and, and price raising features of the cartel. So what I think I've done here, uh, to the extent I'm correct, is in, the sp in much in the spirit of Richardson's work, that is to say convert the, the supposed uh, disadvantage of costly entry into a positive advantage as far as adjustment processes are concerned. Okay, now uh, in the few minutes that remain, let me briefly go over the second form of collusion um, and perhaps somewhat less controversial claim that collusion could be beneficial in the context where it offsets deficient in incentive structures. 
While the first form of collusion improved the adjustment of firms to consumer demands by reducing endogenous uncertainty, the second form improves adjustment by modifying the structure of incentives. Now, an excellent example of this is the recent Supreme Court case, Arizona versus Maricopa County Medical Society, which was decided in 1982. In this case, the defendants were two foundations for medical care, FMCs for short, and the local county medical society with which one of the foundations uh, was closely affiliated. An FMC is a nonprofit corporation of physicians which integrated physician care and health insurance. The FMC entered into contractual relations with sellers of health insurance. These insurers agreed to cover for the purchases of their policies 100% of the cost of care administered by only physicians who are members of the FMC. Member physicians, in return, agreed to, among other things, the following two things. One, to abide by maximum prices set by the FMC for each type of care. Two, to submit to utilization review of the treatment they provided patients. If the FMC concluded that the treatment was unnecessary, the physician would not be paid. This was a very clear example of horizontal price fixing. Indeed, the FMC determined its maximum fees in conjunction with the local medical society. It is not relevant uh, for that uh, these that this is a maximum price fixing because the Supreme Court has firmly placed all price agreements under the per se rule whether they raise, lower, or stabilize prices. The role of price fixing, uh, the price fixing agreement in this case was, I think, to overcome the well-known problem of moral hazard. Under 100% insurance, we have two consequences at least. One, consumers have no incentive to search for the lowest price. Right, because the marginal price is zero. And secondly, physicians have no incentive to limit the quantity and quality of care provided in a cost-effective way. Both will treat the marginal price of care as zero when, from the social perspective, it is clearly not zero. The maximum price is, is a substitute for consumer search. Presumably, the FMC had a great deal of price information. And secondly, the utilization review is a substitute for a positive marginal price and will discourage physicians from administering too much care. This form of organization is more efficient than insurance without price quantity regulation. Clearly, those insurers who participate in the plan will have lower costs and, the, and, this, will, and this can be reflected in lower insurance premiums. Those who fail to participate will therefore be unable to compete. Similarly, physicians who participate will attract more patients, while those who do not will lose patients. Finally, consumers will be better off because they can now get 100% coverage at a lower price. The price fixing agreement thus provides an offset to the imperfections inherent in the market for insurance. This is perhaps a clear illustration of the familiar uh, second best rule we ought not to judge price fixing by static first breast standards when other conditions of perfect competition are also absent. Adjustments under imperfect conditions, adjustment under imperfect conditions, is not necessarily promoted by trying to approximate a perfectly competitive equilibrium. Now, in terms of the, um, the legal doctrines in this area, it's clear that uh, arguing that price fixing arrangements have, horizontal price fixing arrangements especially, have certain redeeming social value is not one which fits into the current, uh, um, the current legal system in the sense that the per se rule really requires us uh, to, to eliminate consideration, not to, to eliminate consideration of possible advantages of, 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 of a particular practice. But one thing which is not all that often recognize is that the rationale of the per se rule, the underlying rationale of the per se rule, is that it is addressed to those kinds of behavior which have an extremely high probability of being antisocial in consequence. And so that the per se rule is itself not something fixed in concrete. That is to say, if a convincing case could be made that there are certain classes of activity in which the probability of antisocial behavior are far, far lower than that originally thought, 
by economic and, and legal analysis, then the rationale, the underlying rationale of the pro se rule breaks down. So I don't think it's impossible by showing the, 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 the social benefits of certain types of collusive arrangements under certain circumstances that uh, the per se rule cannot be uh, whittled away gradually uh, at, uh, uh, in, in the courts or perhaps uh, initially in the, in the economic and lit legal literature. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Uh, next talk is entitled Perfect Competition and the Economics of Information. And uh, this is Dr. Jack High, who received his PhD from UCLA. He's now on leave from the Economics Department here at George Mason University and is visiting Cal State Long Beach for the year. And he's a sorely missed faculty member in the Center for the Study of Market Processes. And his research interest uh, revolves around reformulating microeconomic tools in a market process or disequilibrium framework. Jack? Thank you, Richie, and good afternoon. In his uh, historical contemplation of perfect competition, George Stigler wrote, I quote, the complete theory of competition cannot be known because it is an open-ended theory. It is always possible that a new range of problems will be posed, and then, no matter how well the theory was developed with respect to the earlier range of problems, it may require extensive elaboration in respects which it previously glossed over or ignored. Hardly any important improvement in general economic theory can fail to affect the concept of competition, end quote. Stigler wrote that in 1957. A few years later, he himself was to introduce a new range of problems into economic theory, the problems that are connected with costly information and therefore imperfectly informed traders. The, uh, there is a large and growing literature in economics now that passes under the title of search theory. Now, one of the interesting aspects of search theory is that there are a lot of references in it to competition, but there is no uh, systematic treatment of the subject of competition within search theory. And it seems to me that a systematic uh, treatment should be of interest to economists. For one thing, one of the, uh, one of the essential conditions to, to perfect, comp perfect competition is perfect knowledge. And that assumption, of course, has been dropped in, in search theory. Another reason that I think it should be of interest is that there are a lot of references in search theory, uh, or a lot, of, uh, a lot of statements in search theory about competition that simply contradict one another. And yet a third reason that, uh, that this should be of interest to economists is that when you see competition referred to in search theory, very often you see competitive in quotes. You even find terms like quasi-competition, whatever that might mean. So I think it might be worthwhile for us to, to go through and see how perfect competition fits into, into search theory. My uh, plan here is simply to take the, uh, the conditions, the assumptions or conclusions that are usually uh, associated with perfect competition theory and to see what extent they are compatible with uh, search theory, to see to what extent they have to be modified, and especially to see what policy conclusions follow from the modification of uh, perfect competition. To, uh, to briefly anticipate the conclusions, I think that might make it easier to, to follow the, uh, the paper. My main conclusions are, number one, that, that perfect competition with only very slight modification is compatible with search theory, in fact, is essential to search theory. And to, just to give a name to this slightly revised version of perfect competition, I, have, I call it near, near perfect competition. 
My second conclusion is that although near-perfect competition serves very well as a theoretical construct in search theory, it doesn't serve at all as a welfare norm. As far as I can tell, none of the policy conclusions that flow from perfect competition in general equilibrium theory follow for near-perfect competition in, uh, in antitrust policy. Well, let me start off first then with large numbers. Uh, large numbers of uh, buyers and sellers trading an identical product is a, uh, usually uh, an essential, usually thought of as an essential condition of uh, perfect competition. And it is uh, obviously compatible with, with search theory. More than that, large numbers are essential to a theory of search. That is, unless you have large numbers, you, you won't have search. Uh, maybe I should, should uh, just mention briefly here, search theory is characterized by, by uh, buyers and sellers maximizing the expected value of a random probability distribution. Now, without large numbers, there, except for the simplest kinds of distributions, there will be no distribution over which buyers can search. Uh, furthermore, for firms, unless there are a large number of buyers on the other side of the market, the firms can't figure out what their, what their demand functions are by experimenting with, with price. So large numbers are essential to the theory of search. This has uh, the interesting implication that, that, uh, that a monopolist, at least one who, who charges a single price to all of his customers, really has no place in, in search theory. That is, that uh, if you have a firm out there who is just charging a single price, there's no reason for, there's no reason for buyers to search. Consequently, any comparison now between competition, that is, any comparison between large numbers and a single seller will be sort of an un unfair or an incommensurate comparison. Because on the one hand, you're comparing a, a market in which information is imperfect, that is, a market with large numbers. But on the other hand, you're comparing a, a, a situation in which, in which knowledge is perfect, that is, all buyers know what the, the lowest price is that they can find. Now, an uh, a, a policy implication follows from this, this unequal information of the two different market structures. And that, mar that, that conclusion is this, that large numbers are not necessarily better than a single seller. Okay. Large numbers introduce costs into a market that a single seller does not introduce into a market. Uh, moreover, um, Large numbers of producers may, if they face a, a random distribution of prices, they may uh, produce a smaller output even than a monopolist. Now, Mario mentioned this earlier. This was a somewhat surprising conclusion to me when I came across it. But the reason for it is this, that a monopolist has uh, ex uh, profits greater than that of a, of a competitor. And these expected profits of his will, will, to some extent, offset risk aversion that businessmen are assumed to have. Because of this, because a monopolist is more willing to undertake risk in a world of uncertainty, he actually may produce more output than would a competitor in this world. The, another condition, this is usually uh, a derivative, an implication of uh, large numbers is in, in perfect competition theory is price-taking behavior. When knowledge is perfect, large numbers mean that no single firm can significantly affect price and consequently, at least for all practical purposes, the, the demand curve facing each firm is horizontal. This, this uh, implication has been carried into models with imperfect information, mostly as an assumption uh, much of the work on the theory of the firm in, in search theory makes this assumption, but the soundness of it has been, has been challenged, and I think rightfully so. Uh, Steve Salop, who uh, I understand spoke here at George Mason recently, has asserted that when information is costly, that firms will not be price takers, that they will in fact face downward sloping demand curves, 
and that, therefore, imperfect competition is the appropriate model. Search models that take account of both buyers and sellers in a market simultaneously indicate that, uh, that price-taking behavior by firms is not consistent with profit maximization. That is, if there is, uh, if there is uncertainty in a market, then for various reasons, a, any, any particular firm, even if, it, even if he forms only a small part of the market, can increase his sales by lowering price. Well, if large numbers do not imply price taking, then the slope of the demand curve cannot be used as a basis for distinguishing between a single seller and many sellers. Both a competitive and a, a monopolistic market structure will exhibit downward sloping demand curves when information is costly. Now, it might be possible, I don't, uh, I don't know of any work that has yet compared what happens to elasticity of a demand curve when you, say, have 20 sellers as compared to when you have 30 to 40 and so on in search theory. That is, I don't think search theory models have yet examined what happens as you add more, more competitors to the, the market. But even if they can establish that um, that as you add more, more sellers to a market, that the demand curve becomes more elastic, it won't have the same meaning. It won't carry the same significance in the, in the theory of imperfect information than, than it, as it does in the, in the theory of perfect information. There are a number of reasons for this. I have already mentioned that even if, even if elasticity is, is infinite, the demand curve is flat, it does not mean that large numbers will produce more output than a monopolist will. But another reason that elasticity, at least it would seem to me, won't, won't have the same importance is that we're really comparing two different kinds of, of, uh, of demand curves. If we compare, a, uh, say, a monopolist to, uh, to an industry with a lot of sellers. That is, when, when you're, the, the demand curve of the monopolist is the typical typical demand curve we always see in the textbooks. It's a demand curve under, under, full, under uh, full knowledge. But the demand curve facing a competitor is a stochastic demand curve. Uh, so so what, uh, what, what meaning can we attach to, uh, to elasticity when the demand curve is a probability distribution? I mean, I don't know. I just uh, I open that question up. But the policy implications of, of competitive markets and monopolistic markets facing downward sloping demand curves is, I think, crucial and also fairly obvious. It means that even with large numbers of firms, we cannot conclude in a market with costly information that price will equal marginal cost. Consequently, any policy conclusions that are based on, on, on the superiority of, of price equaling marginal cost cannot be maintained. This uh, has, uh, has rather important ramp ramifications, especially for antitrust policy. Most antitrust policy today is predicated on uh, antitrust enforcement achieving a greater equality between price and marginal cost. One of, one of the peculiar things in antitrust today is that you see writers, uh, very able uh, antitrust writers, uh, Robert Bork, uh, Oliver Williamson to mention too, who on the one hand want to, want to have price equal, uh, they want to have the equality between price and marginal cost as a welfare standard. But on the other hand, they want to readily admit that information is not perfect in a market and that antitrust law should take account of that. Well, uh, what I'm suggesting is that if antitrust law takes account of that properly, they have lost their, their standard by which to uh, prosecute firms. Uh, the, next, uh, the next condition of perfect competition that I would like to consider in this new setting is, uh, is the mobility of resources. 
costless resource mobility has been a traditional assumption of a perfectly competitive theory. Uh, it's costless mobility of resources among different, uh, among different industries is required to show that, uh, that uh, there are no profits to be made in, in any industry. It's required to show that the return to each resource will be equal in all different industries and therefore, of course, it's necessary to, uh, to derive the conclusion that in perfect competition, price equals marginal cost. Well, costless resource mobility obviously cannot be carried over into, uh, into search theory, into theory with costly information, without making some kind of change. The, just the, the cost of acquiring information means that it's going, to, it's going to be costly to acquire resources. So we'd have to modify that assumption to mean something like this, that resources are costlessly mobile except for information costs. That's probably as, as close as we can come to the, the costless resource mobility assumption in, in search theory. Well, if we do modify the assumption that much, here's, here's one, one uh, implication that, that, uh, that falls out of this, is that we cannot then assume that firms don't, do not earn profits. As uh, Grossman and Stiglitz have uh, <laughs> argued recently, costly information and zero profits are incompatible with one another. If it is costly to gather information about profit opportunities, but there are no profits to be earned, then no one is going to gather any information. They obviously have no incentive to. But if no one gathers any information, then how are the factors of production going to be channeled into those areas where they where they have the highest return and consequently reach uh, an, an equilibrium state. Well, if costly information then is extended to include information about profit opportunities, it means that markets must be characterized by profit rates that are great enough to provide an incentive to gather the information. One direct policy implication of this is that profitability in an industry is not necessarily a sign of monopoly. It is simply a manifestation that information is not free. Another policy implication that follows from this is that any attempt by the courts to reduce profitability, all, any attempt runs the risk of impeding the flow of valuable information to the economy. Now this is a particularly, uh, I think it's going to, this, this particular implication of uh, search theory is going to cause particular problems for enforcing antitrust law. Contrary to the assumptions of search theory, marginal costs of, of gathering information can rarely be specified with, with any accuracy. And there's no reason for these costs to be the same in all industries. They could very well be higher in some industries than in others. Well, what this means for the courts is that they're going to have a hard time deciding which firm should be allowed the higher profits and which firm should be allowed the lower profits. Not only that, there's a complication to all of this. A firm who discovers a profit opportunity and, and enters a market and bids for resources does other people in the economy a service. They perform a service. What they do is they bid up the price of, of resources to more accurately reflect the true value of those resources in the economy. And that information is passed along to everyone else in the market, free, so to speak, through the operation of the price system. Well, what value should a court place on this? I mean, he, here is, here is a, a firm that is earning profits that is at the same time providing a valuable service to other people in the economy. What value should be placed on that service? This, uh, this also has uh, implications for the, for the evaluation of, of collusion. See, a price system may not be always the most efficient way to transmit information. It may be that that a more efficient way of transmitting information is for firms to collude. 
Mario has already covered this in some detail, but, but one, of, one of the implications that falls out of search theory is that in general, collusion can be an efficient method of gathering, transmitting, and using information. Even, therefore, if firms collude, and even if that collusion yields a profit to them, it cannot be condemned per se. That profit may be the, uh, the result, may have the, the beneficial result of generating and transmitting valuable information. And finally, the last, uh, the last condition of perfect competition that I want to consider here is perfect knowledge. This is, uh, perfect knowledge is obviously incompatible with search theory. Uh, in fact, the modification of this assumption is, is the very reason for the existence of the theory of, of search. But even if knowledge is not perfect in search theory, it is still very extensive and it still plays a crucial role in the logic of the theory. Uh, here is why that is. Search theory retains for the, uh, retains as the sole method of decision making in economics, maximizing. Buyers maximize the expected returns from, uh, from searching over a distribution for a low price. Uh, sellers maximize the expected profits by, by, by maximize their expected profits by searching for the optimal price uh, to charge different uh, customers. Now, here's what we want to ask. What kind of information is required so that, that buyers and sellers can perform this kind of maximization? Well, here's what buyers have to know. They have to know all the prices that are being charged by the sellers. Uh, and they have to know the frequency with which each price occurs. They also know, have to know the cost of search and they have to know where to search. Without all of that information, the computation of a reservation price and the, the strategy of searching is not, necessarily, is not necessarily optimal. What do firms have to know? Well, firms have to know enough to compute their, their mathematically expected profit functions. Now, what firms have to know to compute this varies. It varies depending on which search model you read. But, but generally speaking, here's what firms have to know. They have to know a great deal about the reservation prices of consumers. They have to know a lot about the, the search strategies that, that consumers are going to follow. And they have to know a great deal about what other firms are charging or are going to charge in the market. So the knowledge that uh, the business firms have to have in order to, to maximize their expected profit function is also very great. Now, if we extend our, our horizon to models with more than one good, I've, I've given you the information that consumers and, and firms have to know just in, a, just in a partial equilibrium model. If we extend our horizon to, to include a more general model, uh, buyers would have to know additional information. Here's what they'd have to know. They would have to know every good that was available for them to purchase. In other words, they would have to have the Sears catalog, for example, memorized. They would have to know the utility that each unit of, e of all of these goods would yield them. They would have to know the price distribution of every good in the market. They would have to know where to go to search for the low prices in every good in the market. Uh, and they would have to know uh, the costs of searching. If we, if we look on the other side of the market, firms, well, firms have to know then not only in, in a general model, firms have to know not only the, uh, the uh, expected profit function in their own industry, they have to know the expected profit function in every other industry as well. Otherwise, they may commit resources to an industry that really does not have the highest expected profits for them. So while the knowledge required for agents to maximize probability distributions isn't perfect, it's not perfect, it's very nearly so. And I call this, um, this, this knowledge requirement near perfect knowledge and consequently the, the idea of competition that's based on near perfect knowledge I call near perfect competition. 
near perfect knowledge and near perfect competition are as essential to search theory as perfect knowledge and perfect competition are to neoclassical theory. Well, to, uh, to briefly summarize and to, to uh, state what to make of all this, uh, here's, here's what we conclude. We can conclude. We can conclude that with only slight modification, the, the conditions necessary for perfect competition are also applicable, that is also compatible with, economics with costly information. Even more important, we can conclude that conditions very similar to those required for, for perfect competition and equilibrium theory are also required for search theory and uh, consequently for near-perfect competition. Unless there are large numbers, there's no random probability distribution to maximize. Unless resources are mobile at fairly reasonable costs, there is no incentive to gather information on profit opportunities. Unless there is near-perfect knowledge, maximizing probability distributions does not lead to optimal decisions. Now, I might mention here that large numbers and near-perfect knowledge are used in all, in every search model that I have come across. And assumptions about resource mobility, I think, will become more important as the theory is extended from partial equilibrium to, to general equilibrium. So as far as positive analysis is concerned, that is, as far as, uh, as analysis of, uh, of uh, economic markets with, uh, with uh, costly information that is all captured in probability distributions, we can say that near-perfect competition is, uh, performs the same function for that theory that perfect competition does for equilibrium theory. But it doesn't come anywhere near to providing the same normative functions. Large numbers do not imply price taking by firms. We don't even know, know for sure if larger numbers imply greater elasticity for, uh, of demand. And even if they do, there is no, no assurance that this will lead to greater output. Uh, therefore, any, any conclusion based on equality between price and marginal cost is out the window when there's costly information. Uh, co uh, costly information about, uh, about profit opportunities is incompatible with a no-profit equilibrium. And the external benefits of, of ha having information transmitted through the price system make it almost impossible to formulate a workable antitrust policy. I think the main, the main conclusion to be learned from all from this is the following that once you introduce just a little bit of, of, of incomplete knowledge, just a little bit of uncertainty in the markets, and believe me, search theory doesn't introduce very much. Uh, I, I would, it's not a realistic theory by any stretch of the imagination. But all you have to do is introduce just a little bit, and all the, all the welfare conclusions of perfect competition simply fall to the ground. When information is costly, we have no economic rationale for antitrust policy. It appears that uh, Stigler, in the same article uh, that appeared in 1957, was prophetic when he wrote, and here's another quote from Stigler, the time may well come when the competitive concept suitable to positive analysis is not suitable to normative analysis. Well, I think uh, for economics of uh, costly information, that day has arrived. Okay, now we'll hear from Dick Langlois uh, in a talk titled Non-Conventional Approaches to the Theory of Competition. Dick received his PhD from Stanford in Engineering. He was associated with the Austrian Economics Program at NYU for three years, where he also taught in the uh, Economics Department and the Graduate School of Business. His current research uh, interests uh, revolve around the role of information in economic theory and the internal organization of firms. And I think since Jim Buchanan plugged uh, his book this morning, we may want to plug a book for Dick. I understand he's editing a book on uh, economics as a process. Okay. Thanks. 
Thanks, Rich. Well, I get the feeling listening to the conference participants today that, that if not the title, then at least the theme of the conference is what's wrong with antitrust. And I think there are at least two ways you could think about the, the issue of what's wrong with antitrust. One of them is to say, as I think Professor Brosen at least implied, if not actually said uh, this noon, is that the problem with antitrust is that people haven't applied, haven't, as he put it, uh, examined antitrust through the lens of price theory enough. That is, we haven't applied economic theory enough to, to uh, antitrust. And in many ways, that's, that was what I heard coming through in some of the morning sessions. But there's another, and indeed diametrically opposite way we could think about what's wrong with antitrust. And that's um, in some way the theme of, of uh, this session. And that is, maybe what's wrong with antitrust is precisely that we've applied too much uh, economics to uh, uh, antitrust policy. That there may be something wrong with the theory itself and something that we should concern ourselves about. And maybe there, isn't, there might indeed be something in the very way we think about the economics of competition that leads us to wrong conclusions about, uh, about antitrust policy. I want to explore that second approach uh, with you right now. Um, before doing that, let me, let me make a, a distinction that I think is very important, and that's a distinction between what I would call, what other economists have called, formal theory and appreciative theory. That is to say, there is on the one hand the theory that uh, the formal theory that economists who call themselves theorists write to one another in journals. Okay. And there is, on the other hand, appreciative theory, that is, the theory that economists use to explain things to themselves, to explain things to people who aren't economists, and perhaps to do antitrust policy. Um, and there's a case to be made that, that while the conventional appreciative theory has is very subtle and, and very uh, subtle, it's not, uh, and it is adapted to the diverse problems of the antitrust law, that the formal theory got left behind somewhere. That when a, a good economist talks about what's wrong with antitrust and uh, uh, examines it through the lens of price theory, it's not the lens of formal price theory, but the lens of a, a more down-to-earth appreciative theory. It's formal theory that I want to talk about today. And what I want to do is compare uh, what you might call the conventional wisdom uh, price theory uh, or the theory, of, the theory of competition as it applies to antitrust with uh, some uh, potential alternatives. Uh, and a couple of these are, are, view themselves as genuine alternatives, and at least one of them, I will claim, is, is best viewed perhaps as not an alternative so much as, as uh, uh, a preemptive counter-revolution attempting to uh, save the more conventional theory. Well, these four are, first of all, the conventional theory, which sometimes goes under the heading in uh, industrial organization courses of the structure conduct performance paradigm, but I mean mostly straight, ordinary, everyday neoclassical price theory. I um, also want to talk briefly about the, the quote, Austrian theory, um, about so-called evolutionary or neo-Schumpeterian views of, of um, economics, and finally about the new theory of contestable markets. And, uh, what I want to do is, is describe those to you briefly and perhaps a little too carelessly, a little too carelessly both from an uh, economic methodology and philosophy of science point of view and perhaps also a little too carelessly uh, from the economic point of view, but there's not much time and I hope I can at least give you the flavor of these things. And then um, discuss what implications for theory, um, excuse me, what implications for policy one might want to draw uh, on sort of the intuitive, uh, draw sort of intuitively from the, these, these formal theories. Well, I think I can be fairly brief about the neoclassical uh, theory with the uh, so-called structure conduct performance paradigm uh, appended to it. Um, uh, Mario and Jack have already talked a little bit, I think, about some of its, uh, some of its shortcomings. Um, you really have to go back to the 19th century to understand what's going on in neoclassical price theory. It really started with Cournot and others in the 19th century. And they had a vision of how economics should work and what economics should be about. And that vision uh, was, in some ways, to make economics a little more like the natural sciences of the day. Uh, that's often been remarked upon. Uh, but more particularly, they wanted, as, as well Rob put it, they wanted a science that was independent of human will. That is, they wanted the conclusions of this science not to depend on how people behave or how people act in some sense. 
So what they did is they transformed a concept of competition that, com that Adam Smith had possessed, in which competition was what competition means essentially to the businessman. It's an active verb. That is, it's a behavioral notion of competition. When you, something is competitive when there are people competing against one another in some behavioral sense. And the early neoclassical economists translated that into uh, competition as a state of affairs. Competition in neoclassical theory is not defined as anything you do. It's defined as a state of affairs. It is a state of affairs in which uh, all economic agents are price takers, basically. There are adjoint assumptions to that, but basically in which no agent can uh, affect price. And the way we examine the welfare implications of such a theory is, at least as Cournot had hoped, look only at the structure of the economy. That is, count the number of firms. And in fact, Cournot wrote down a function that gave you the welfare implications of a market structure as a function of the number of firms. He could tell you what proportion of the competitive output, it's n over n plus 1 if you're interested, times the competitive output is generated by any um, um, structure of firms in the, in the economy. And while some of the formal theory and most of the appreciative theory of neoclassical economics has progressed beyond that, the basic um, Presumptions of the theory are that. They are very much as Cournot left them. They're, it's a static and timeless view of the world in which market structure is predominant. Now, if you believe this and then you go out and look at the world, uh, you begin to have this gap between formal theory and appreciative theory. Or as the philosophers of science might put it, you begin to see some anomalies in the theory. But as you say, well, this can't possibly be right. Um, a, lot, a number of people have remarked, oh, you can have any number of structures and still have, diff have any, give me any structure you want and I can come up with uh, uh, any set of any uh, along the spectrum of welfare implications for that structure. Under certain assumptions, a duopoly might be just as good as a perfectly competitive firm. Well, that, that's, um, that's only one of the anomalies that came up and people dealt with that by adding to the to the pure structuralist view the conduct part that is the structure conduct performance paradigm says we'll assess performance by looking not just at structure but by looking also at at conduct okay well that curing that anomaly in a sense generated another one because then you once you put behavior into the equation then your whole theory of imperfect competition your whole theory of collusion of oligopoly falls apart because there you can't do with what Ra wanted. You can't take out human will. You've got a game theory problem. If you've got only three firms, you have this endogenous uncertainty that Mario talked about. You can't predict anything. It could, if given one set of conjectural variations, as the game theorists say, come up with one answer. Given another one, you could come up with another. So there's really no, um, as many economists would concede, there exists no neoclassical theory. Um, of oligopoly, not one that's consistent with the philosophical foundations of neoclassical economics. Um, another problem with it is, I think perhaps the most glaring problem to which uh, Professor Brosen also alluded in his, his talk today, is that it's very difficult to reconcile the microeconomic welfare implications of the neoclassical model with sort of macroeconomic performance of firms. That is to say, the neoclassical model in its pure form would lead you to suspect that the, the best structure from a welfare point of view is perfect competition. That means a zillion little firms, or as the, the, the hyper-mathematical theorists would now put it, uh, uh, firms all of which are, have, have a measure zero, okay, that are infinitely, they're actually more than infinitely small. Okay, this is the optimum uh, arrangement. Yet we see that where all the progress lies in society, as, as Schumpeter pointed out in the 1940s, we look where all the progress is in societies, where the costs are screaming down, where, where all of the, uh, the markets are being filled, it's by big firms. It's not by little firms. We look at where the little firms are, and they're mom and pop grocery stores, and people who grow rice and stuff like that, and they're not, um, they're not where the engine, as Schumpeter would put it, the engine of the capitalist system is. Okay, so it's hard to reconcile in, in some sense. Um, neoclassical uh, uh, welfare implications with the more macroeconomic ones. Okay, and there, there are other problems. For example, it, it just is, the neoclassical model simply assumes the structure of the market. Okay, whereas we see markets progressing over time, and the neoclassical model sort of sees structure as, as if not entirely exogenous, something that's given as indeed a control variable. It's something we can play with. Okay, and it's not something that's uh, an organic, as it were, part of the, the process itself. Well, other theories have have tried to address some of these anomalies, if you'll let me call them anomalies. Um, <clears throat> one of them is, is the Austrian theory, which to some extent I think uh, Mario and Jack have hinted at. 
that goes back certainly to, to Karl Menger and inclu includes names like uh, Hayek and Kersner. And it, it, what it is in some sense an attempt to do is resurrect uh, Adam Smith's notion of competition, the idea that competition is a behavioral activity and competing is a process. That's something you do, it's not a state of affairs. Okay. Um, <clears throat> they also have, a, in some ways, a different view of rationality. That is, they're not obsessed as Walra or Cournot were with getting free will out of the system in the particular way that, that the neoclassical economists were. So they have, they're inclined to define rationality in, in a different way and they see rationality as having to do more with learning over time rather than making an optimal decision given a static set of, given a, sta a given set of, of, of resources. Um, Kirsner's version of this will stress something called entrepreneurship, that is, uh, the fact or the possibility that w there are always people ready to jump into the system with new ideas, as it were, to seize on profit opportunities, to snatch quasi-rents, if you will. And this is really, to, to, to Kirsner, this is sort of the engine of the system. It's a process that's moved along um, by these uh, entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, in Kersner's view, in a sense, the market is inherently competitive because if you postulate as an engine these entrepreneurs who are always out there competing in a behavioral sense, then by your definition of competition, the, the market is sort of inherently uh, competitive. Okay. Um, this does better on these anomalies. Okay. You can reconcile, uh, in, in a sense, uh, larger firms or confirm firms that are taking active price, making active price moves in the market with, with good welfare implications. Um, it tends to, um, the problem of oligopoly being indeterminate goes away because you've reformulated the problem in such a way that this isn't a problem, basically. Um, and you allow for an, an endogenous market structure. That is, you allow market structure to be generated by your model itself. It's not something that's outside of the model or a control variable. Okay. Um, there's, I don't. There are certainly some differences, if not problems, with this, uh, with this view, and for, uh, especially it's not very specific about how all of this is supposed to work, and never gets. Uh, for example, if we're worried about large firms, there really is no Austrian theory of large firms. Okay, um, but the 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 the, uh, the theory is at such a level that that those problems, um, in some sense, don't arise. Now, the third view that I want to talk about briefly is, is in many ways closely related, that is the evolutionary, uh, the evolutionary approach. And this I associate mostly with uh, names of Nelson and Winter who've recently come out with a, with a book on the subject. But in many ways this might also be called an Austrian theory in the sense that the book is motivated by an attempt to capture the spirit of the writings of Schumpeter who was of course uh, also an Austrian. Um, um, this evolutionary model focuses attention on some different parameters of the system, for example. Um, it's concerned with diversity in the economy. Uh, Mario talked about frictions. Okay, well, the, as an evolutionary theory, very much like biological evolution, um, this evolutionary theory accepts the idea and depends on the idea, just as, as Mario suggested, that you have to have these frictions in the economy. You have to have diversity. That it, it, sometimes it doesn't make any sense. It won't work if everybody has the same cost function. You've got to have diversity because there can't be selection without diversity. There's also got to be some frictions in the sense that there has to be uh, habit and convention in the system. That people aren't constantly running around optimizing things. That there are just too many things for them to consciously to optimize. So they, they have, to have to be, be a little... little um, resistance in the system and that's how you get uh, the genetic part of the selection process. Um, they also have a behavioral view of competition. They also have a learning view of rationality, that rationality is more, is more learning in the process than it is making optimal decisions in any sense. Uh, what differentiates this a little bit, not only the, the explicitly biological aspect, uh, but also the Schumpeterian aspect differentiates this from the Aust what I've called the Austrian theory. That is, these writers are more interested in the problem of innovation. Following Schumpeter, um, as I say, Schumpeter was concerned with the question of um, the issue that big firms tend to do well. But more than that, he was concerned with his idea of entrepreneurship, which if, if we could call Kirsner's idea of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship in the small, Schumpeter's idea was entrepreneurship in the very large. That is, he was concerned with massive changes in the system, massive innovations, 
uh, in the system, how things change, not how one industry takes a given set of resources, a given set of knowledge, and allocates it in some optimal fashion, but how industries change what we think of as knowledge, change the cost structures of industries, change the markets, uh, invent new products, and so on, okay? So these writers try to build that, um, that idea of what Schumpeter called creative destruction um, into the market. Now, this, um, this theory also does uh, reconcile some of the, is able to deal with some of the anomalies, okay? Um, it also can reconcile the welfare implications of large firms with the fact, with, with um, sort of its view of market structure. And it does this in some ways in a more detailed in, uh, way than the Austrian theory does because it, they are concerned with the theory of the big firm, how firms grow and die, uh, what causes big firms, uh, um, is it better, what, what are the, the ramifications of innovation versus, versus um, uh, uh, imitation, for example, okay? Uh, again, the, the, the problem of oligopoly goes away because the whole premise of the system is changed in such a way that this is not a problem, that you have pe firms, instead of assuming that there are three big firms and that they're fighting with each other in some sense and, and trying to outguess one another in the way that Mario described, um, you have a system in which firms, the size of firms is the result of the process and not the input to the process. That is, oligopoly is not something you start with, it may be something you, you do or do not end up with as you watch the process um, evolve over time. And this is, again, much closer, to, I think, to our uh, appreciative theory of how things work when we talk about the microelectronics firms and how the shakeout is going to work in the small computer industry, for example. We're, t we're doing this, uh, what, what they would call a reverse Schumpeterian model, that is where, where uh, firms start off small and then end up big as, as uh, innovative firms beat out one another or try to excel, uh, try to get better than one another in a behavioral, uh, behavioral sense. Um, and again, this one also in a very real way stresses uh, market structure as endogenous and is concerned with the, the evolution of uh, market structure. The fourth, one, the fourth um, cluster of models or, or theory that I want to talk about is called the contestable markets theory. And that's recently been, and this, this is something that's come to the fore in the last, last couple of years. Uh, it's associated with especially the name of Will Beaumont, a, a former colleague at NYU, and a number of other people. What contestable markets seeks to do, and, and let me say it basically stays, and, and this is, the, I think, the key thing to understand about contestable markets theory, is that it basically stays within the premises and framework of the uh, theory set down by Cournot and Walras in the 19th, 19th century, but it seeks to replace the, the standard of perfect competition of many little producers with perfect information, free entry, la la la, who can't affect price, with the idea of perfect contestability. And uh, what they mean by perfect contestability is a market in which it is perfectly costless to enter and perfectly costless to exit. Okay, but they mean costless, not in the sense that Mario meant it, but in precisely the opposite sense. That is, I mean, free entry in, the, in precisely the opposite sense. It has to be costless in the sense that Stigler wants to find. That is, someone can enter the market without any uh, cost disadvantage over, other, uh, uh, over the existing firms or, or under the existing firms. Okay? Um, that they have this, they, if they, somebody jumps into the market uh, and tries to, to uh, attack IBM and personal computers that they that they can produce personal computers at the same cost as IBM and it makes all of the it, it takes in all of the the standard assumptions about what one means by a cost curve and and, and so on um, this does um, deal with I mean it's in some ways you can understand this theory as precisely an attempt to deal with those three anomalies that I talked about but keep it within the, the traditional framework Okay, that's one way to understand what contestable markets is. Um, for example, in the second anomaly, the one about, about oligopolies and this problem of indeterminacy in, in the theory of oligopoly, they get around that um, uh, completely because if you have free entry in this sense, people always running in to snatch quasi-rents, then you don't, then 
the conjectural variation of the incumbents is, is perfectly determinate. You don't have to worry about what it is, okay? And they prove this with mathematical theorems and so on. Notice that this is very similar. They've done this in a way that's very similar to, to uh, Kirzner's idea of entrepreneurship. The people, what disciplines the system is not the structure so much as it is the possibility of people running in and snatching quasi rents, okay? But since Beaumont and, and uh, his, his uh, cohorts insist on retaining the neoclassical conception of rationality, they have to define this as free exit in the neo, uh, free entry and exit in the neoclassical sense because all actors are rational and have perfect information and no rational actor would enter a market if he had to commit fixed costs that were higher than the cost of the incumbent and so on. Okay, Kirzner doesn't have to worry about that because he's, he, he doesn't necessarily adhere to that definition of rationality, that it may be possible for entrepreneurs to run in for all sorts of reasons to get quasi-rents. There can be divergences in people's estimates. Okay, we can have um, more radical kinds of uncertainty in which people will enter anyway, even though it's, it's quote, irrational if you know all the facts, but, but you don't know all the facts, and even if you did know all the facts, you might not interpret them all the same way. Okay, so that, they handle that in some ways um, the same way. Also, they get around, they, they want another implication of contestable markets is that you're not worried about um, market structure anymore. Okay, what, they, what they show is that you don't need perfect competition in the sense of, of atomism okay, to have good welfare implications. Now, again, these are good welfare implications in the neoclassical sense of no dead weight loss triangles and all that sort of thing. Um, you can have any kind of market structure. A uh, monopoly, a single monopoly seller might be a problem, but duopoly and on up, that's fine. As long as it's contestable, any number of, of uh, players is consistent with the Pareto optimum, okay? First best, indeed, Pareto optimum. Now this is, in some ways, responding to, to the anomaly that the Chicago School and other people have pointed out, saying that if you have a pure structuralist view, uh, it, it doesn't make any sense because I, could, I can, sh I can uh, give you plausible cases why any market structure would reach an optimum. Well, they're sort of conceding that point and saying any market structure can uh, concede an optimum as long as it's perfectly, perfectly contestable. The, the contestable markets writers also make the claim that they're superior to the standard theory in the sense that they um, also can generate market structure endogenously, that unlike neoclassical theory, um, they don't take market structure as exogenous. Well, I think a uh, careful reading will suggest that this is a somewhat overstated claim. Uh, in fact, market structure is endogenous in contestable markets theory in precisely the same way that it's endogenous or exogenous in standard theory. That is, if you give me the assumptions and the cost functions, then I can calculate an, a, a, quote, optimal market structure. Okay. Uh, it may be that I get a different mar optimal market structure under, under contestable markets, but to say that I've generated, because I, can, because I can calculate an optimal market structure, to say that I've therefore generated a market structure endogenously is, I think, uh, stretching it, at least in the sense that it, it could certainly also be true, held true of, of the standard theory. Okay. Um, there are some other implications of, of contestable markets that I, I won't go into. I'll probably leave those to the Marxists, whether the right-wing Marxists or the left-wing Marxists, since I'm neither kind, I won't go into them. But these have to do with what, what we might call the, we might call the AT&T problem. That is, um, contestable markets have the following implications if a market is perfectly contestable. That is, um, a monopoly can be good. A monopoly can be, indeed, under certain restricted assumptions, a monopoly can be second best optimal, maybe even first best optimal. Okay, a monopoly like, say, AT&T, and this is especially true of a multi-product, or at least is also true of a multi-product monopoly like AT&T. But while it may be optimal in the, in the sense that it perfectly allocates resources in a given period, it's not optimal uh, over time. That is, if free entry is permitted, free entry in Mario's sense is permitted, Okay, over time, uh, then you'll get the waste of competition and inefficiency. So what, you, what this says, at least or it might say to a left or right wing Marxist, is that the, these writers, all of whom were in the employ of AT&T when they came up with these theories, have come up with a theory that says that what's good is to have a regulated monopoly that doesn't, where you don't allow anybody to, uh, to have free entry to compete with that monopoly. Um, but I, as I say, I'm not going to pursue whether these conclusions are, are right or wrong. Um, Okay, what, what are the, some of the, the problems with contestable markets theory? Well, um, one of the problems, as I, as I hinted, is that um, 
it retains all of the assumptions, basically, of neoclassical theory. A lot of the assumptions that Jack and other people have attacked as being, as being not, very, um, not very useful. However you like that, I won't uh, draw conclusions. Um, but it's important to notice that it's, and sometimes new, uh, condensable markets theory is used to try to generate dynamic conclusions about things. Okay? There was an interchange in the American Economic Review uh, a few months ago in which some writers pointed out some problems with trying to apply contestable markets as a dynamic theory, and Bomal responded that, uh, well, you misunderstand. It's purely a static theory. It has no, it has no dynamic implications at all, okay? which is certainly a weakness for a theory that, that is sort of, in some sense, advertises itself as a way to get around from some of the static problems of neoclassical theory. Uh, a more important problem is that it's not at all clear what happens if you have any deviation, what the welfare implications are of even slight deviations from perfect contestability. Okay, maybe the theory needs to be developed to work these out and so on. Uh, but in perfect competition, there's sort of a spectrum, at least in the pure Cournot version of it. Um, if you get a little bit away from perfect competition, well, that's only a little bit worse than perfect competition. What happens when you get away from perfect contestability? Nobody knows. It could be terrible, okay? Uh, so uh, this is something that, that uh, they need to be worried about. How much time do I have? Okay, well, I probably won't need that much. Let me sum up by... Um, sort of giving you a, a view of what, of what the, the sort of heuristic implications are on some level of each of these theories for antitrust policy. That if, um, again, if you take seriously the formal theory, what is it, how does it affect your intuitions about what you should look for in antitrust policy? Okay, well, if you take the traditional formal theory, what you want to look out for is structure. You want to look out for how many firms there are in the market and come up with Herfindahl indexes and things like that. Um, if you're pushed a little bit and get away from the purely formal theory and throw in a little game theory, then maybe you want to wor worry about what some people call behavior and other people call conduct. That is whether there's collusion, but you interpret that not in the, uh, in the subtle way that Mario, Mario did, but in the simple-minded simple, simple -minded sense that only thing collusion can do is raise, is raise prices. Okay, so you want to watch out for collusion. Um, also, you, you want to w worry about cost curves. Okay, now if you're uh, any kind of a sensible economist, you'll recognize what's called the Williamson, uh, some people call the Williamson trade-off. That is, um, sure, having a smaller number of firms might be, um, might be bad in the sense that these firms will collude and raise their price above marginal cost, but these bigger firms uh, may have lower costs to start out with than the smaller firms, precisely because they're big and can do economies of scale. So there's a trade-off there. A trade-off, which, by the way, is not a lot, not permitted in the uh, current antitrust laws. That, that efficiency is not a is not a at least in my understanding. I may be stand corrected. Is not a is not a defense in uh, an antitrust case. So if you if you say, well, sure, we're we're big and we're colluding and so on, but we're much more efficient than all those guys who weren't colluding anyway. That's still not um, not a defense. Okay, so those are the things you want to look out for. If you are an Austrian theorist, well, here you. You have this idea that the market is, is, by our definitions of what a market process is, in some sense inherently competitive. That is, uh, unlike, the, unlike the neoclassical case, you don't necessarily suspect that there is a natural tendency towards monopoly or that monopolies can arise sort of arbitrarily and without cause, uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of monopolies that sort of, uh, sort of spring up. Um, there's always competitive forces in some sense, these entrepreneurs waiting around to snatch quasi rents that are going to discipline the system. This makes you somewhat skeptical, um, and especially if you add in the, the subjectivity, the subjectivism uh, view of cost that Jim Buchanan alluded to this morning. It makes you skeptical of one's ability to judge the welfare properties of various market structures. Okay. Um, what it might lead you to do, this is, it's, but again, the theory is at such a high level that you don't get into the details. Okay, you 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 sort of rule out even looking at some of the details of whether a market, whether uh, this the, this Williamson trade-off or the Schumpeterian trade-off, which is the Williamson trade-off and another guys are operating. You don't care whether. I mean, you're less concerned perhaps with whether there are temporary. Um, uh, raises a, a temporary rises of price above marginal cost. You're more concerned with the long-run view of the process. But what it might lead you to look for is structural impediments to competition, okay? And that would mean certainly government intervention, but it might, it might mean other things, okay? Structure, you might uh, be able to, pr to make statements about um, how 
an organization of the firm or, or an organization of markets might or might not speed up this inherently competitive process. Indeed, you might want to link this whole theory with the theory of property rights and a property rights approach to monopoly, as Jerry O'Driscoll and Mario and other Austrian writers uh, are trying to do. Um, if you have the, the uh, evolutionary or the Schumpeterian view, um, you have some of the same intuitions as the Austrians, but in fact, a lot of these writers are, are perhaps le less unwilling to plunge into the details of competition. Um, they would say maybe we can make statements about antitrust and maybe antitrust isn't a fruitless thing, but we want to look for entirely different things than you looked for under neoclassical economics. For one thing, you want to be concerned with innovation. You want to think that innovation is far more important or at least as important as a static allocation of resources. That is, um, what structures in the market or what market structures, if we have to talk about market structures, will lead firms to be more innovative? Which, what set of property rights among, uh, in terms of patents, appropriability of information and so on, will be most conducive to an efficient use of R&D and to, and to a, a faster um, uh, innovative, innovative process? Okay. Um, you'd also be concerned with institutions and how they, uh, they might generate diversity in the economy. You might be concerned with questions of, of, of uh, gaining and losing diversity, okay? Um, as I say, you might be concerned with the problem of appropriating knowledge and how at least not only strict property rights but de facto property rights and knowledge are set up and, and used in firms. Uh, and you might want to judge firms by a different standard. You might want to judge the economy by a slightly different standard. Instead of worrying about an, optimal in, an optimum in some sense, okay, if you've got a world that's always innovating and changing, okay, you, you might be more interested in looking at things like flexibility and adaptiveness of the system rather than whether it's efficient at any point of time. You might want to worry about um, what some writers call the Schumpeterian trade-off. That is how do we trade off or, or how do firms trade off between static efficiency allocations in a given period and innovativeness over time? Okay? Do we have to give up some, uh, a few dead weight loss triangles in the current period in order to get firms that are more innovative in the long run? This was essentially the gist of Schumpeter's discussion in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. That we have sure firms are um, big firms uh, don't set price equal to marginal cost. They, they're not price takers. They do all this nasty stuff that looks like bad static allocation, but they're dynamic. They do, uh, the process that they're dealing with is, is uh, a much more important process. In fact, Schumpeter said that the process of innovation um, is, uh, is to, to static uh, efficiency views of competition as a frontal assault is to, is to uh, uh, trying to break in at the door, okay? It's, it's like trying to blow the whole building down instead of forcing a door. And, and Schumpeter at least be, believed that we should worry much more about that side of things. Uh, if you have a contestable markets view, it's not entirely clear to me, perhaps I'm not as familiar with the literature as I ought to be, but it's not entirely clear to me what your views should be. You're still going to be concerned with cost. You may not be as concerned with structure as you were in the past because we've agreed that in uh, the perfect Conte perfectly contestable ideal, structure itself doesn't matter, any structure could give you good results, but you're still interested in cost curves because you're worried that you've got this neoclassical version of rationality in which everybody knows everything already, and so nobody's going to jump in until, they, uh, until they're sure that um, their cost, they're not going to give up, they're not going to uh, commit themselves to any fixed cost. So you have to know about cost curves in order to, to, to uh, on the one hand, know whether the market is perfectly contestable, whether people are going to jump in or not, and on the other hand, to deduce from, calculating, from, from calculations what the optimal uh, market structure will be. In the, to, to know that, you have to have uh, cost curves, so you're still worried, certainly worried about that. Okay, and again, there are these AT&T implications that I'm not going to um, not going to speculate on. Um, what is the benefit of looking at alternative theories? Okay, well, again, one of the benefits I think is that the formal theory, however far away our appreciative theory gets from the formal theory, this, this, the formal theory still tugs at us. It tugs at us with metaphors. It tugs at us with words. And, and if antitrust is, as Professor Brosen suggested at lunch, a matter of, of uh, accusation by labeling, then it matters um, how, our, how our theories label things. If our theory says that, that to go out and actively 
adjust change prices and bring new products to the market is defined as competition, okay, that's a very different label from saying that that's predatory pricing. Okay, or that's, that's inconsistent with our definition of pricing, which we admit is just a technical definition, but the words have resonance and the words are important. So if there's no, and I think there are a lot of other reasons for wanting to think about theories, but if there are no other reasons, there's, there's at least that reason. Thank you. Okay, we're going to open up the floor for about 15 minutes of questions and answers. And I'd like to ask the audience to speak up. And I'm going to ask the speakers to repeat the questions when they get up to the podium so that everyone in the audience can hear. OK. Any questions? Yes? Why, other than the messiness or some other reason like that, you left the consumer or the buyers out of your endogenous model. Demand curves also can shift as a result of things like exclusive behavior. The question is, why did I leave the uh, consumers out of the uh, uh, picture of endogenous uncertainty? Um, I'm not sure that I did so. Uh, first of all, I'm not sure I understand the, the import of the question, um, why uh, the question is being asked exactly, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't leave the consumers out uh, uh, with any purpose in mind other than to focus in on a particular aspect of the problem, uh, which was, uh, uh, I thought, important, and there were time limitations. The, um, it, well, could you, could you make more explicit what you mean? Yeah, sure. I think that that's an important point. And uh, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm confused by your use of the word collusion to to lawyer, which I am. And in the dictionary, collusion necessarily uh, has as an element secrecy, concealment, or fraud. I assume none of you meant that when you use the word collusion. Could you tell me what you do mean? Well, I, I think for purposes of, an, of the antitrust law, uh, whether the uh, agreement, say, to fix prices, not to use the word collusion again, okay, the agree, an agreement to fix prices is per se illegal, whether it's secretive or not. I mean, if I, uh, the, in fact, it's almost necessarily going to be secretive in a regime in which it's illegal to do so. So it's sort of self-fulfilling in that sense. But um, I don't, uh, as far as what I'm, I'm discussing, whether the agreement is secretive or open is not rele relevant. Okay. Um, Entrepreneurs to in invest uh, when they don't know the uh, intentions of their competitors. Uh, if I understand you, if this were if this were a serious and widespread problem in the economy, we should ex look at the economy and we should expect to see a relatively large number of cases where uh, there was unfulfilled demand, where there were opportunities for investment in, say, uh, standardized products such as petrochemicals, and prices above the, uh, the level necessary to draw in capital, uh, and shortages of those types of products. And I would like the, so that if this type of problem were at all widespread in the economy, would you not expect that type of, of, to be able to look at the economy and see those types of, of uh, cases fairly often? And in fact, do we? Uh, it's not my experience. It, I mean, it's my experience that uh, 
that that is an extremely rare occurrence in our economy. I had suggested to Richie Fink that uh, um, Dick Langlois and Jack High answer questions on my paper, and I will answer questions on their papers, but I don't know if uh, that's permitted uh, procedure. Um, do, why, if, if what I discuss in terms, the question is, if what I discuss in terms of endogenous uncertainty is at all important, why uh, you would expect to observe um, presumably uh, unexploitable profit opportunities in a number of industries, and so we would see fairly high profit rates in those industries for over, over periods of time. Uh, first of all, I think I, I, in discussing sort of the eight factors which make for uh, uh, beneficial collusion, uh, the other way of looking at those eight factors is when they're not present or when their converse is present, okay, when there is, uh, when, when some of these quote unquote frictions are present, uh, collusion will be less necessary, less socially beneficial. And so uh, empirically one could argue that in many industries uh, we don't really, you know, collusion isn't really necessary uh, from a, a, a social perspective to ensure coordination because enough frictions quote unquote are present in order to do that. Uh, even uh, many uh, uh, fervent uh, trust busters w would agree that collusion is not the predominant uh, uh, form of uh, arrangement or attempted collusion would not be the predominant form of arrangement uh, in the American economy even if we abolish the antitrust laws, that there are factors which make that unlikely. So I guess my roundabout answer to your question is simply that um, I would agree that probably in many industries, uh, the factors making for be the benefits of social benefits of collusion are not present. But I would also say that we probably do observe uh, industries in which profit rates uh, remain high over periods of time, perhaps higher uh, over longer periods of time than might otherwise uh, be the case. Um, and uh, uh, I think that some of the explanation for that need not rest on, uh, on, on monopoly or actual collusion, but rather rest on the difficulties in exploiting profit opportunities. But I agree with you ultimately that it's an empirical question and one has to look at the specific cases to determine whether these factors are important. But I think the beginning ought, a beginning ought to be made on the theoretical level to, to specify the conditions under which collusion might be socially beneficial and then once those those things are, are carefully worked out to then go to the empirical level to see how it works out in practice and if, it's, if it is indeed important. I want to do something that may be illegitimate and take a moderator's prerogative to suggest a study by Rob Bradley, who's working in Houston, where he showed that the oil industry, by colluding together, was trying to solve the problem of free riders on common oil pools that transcended a lot of private property. So they'd, they'd sink different oil wells uh, on different pieces of land parcel on the surface, and of course for every gallon they took out, they depleted their uh, neighbors. So they overused that resource, and what they did was they got together and, and cartelized or colluded in order to conserve oil during the 1920s. And that's a study I understand that the Cato Institute will be coming out in the I think in terms of semesters, uh, spring semester.
Do I need to repeat that? Did everybody hear it? Everyone heard it. The, uh, no, I, I don't, uh, I agree with you. I, see, I'm talking about search theory and, and you're talking about the real world. And, uh, <laughs> and those are two very different things. There are, no, there are no entrepreneurs in search theory. They do prove equilibrium price distributions under very restrictive kind of assumptions. Uh, one thing they rule out are, are the introduction of new products and the lowering of, of uh, costs. So uh, they're, they're just two, two different worlds. I, maybe I should say something that I'm very critical of search theory, although you would never know it from the talk I, I gave here today. And the, on, the only purpose I had in going through and examining competition in search theory is that search theory introduces the smallest amount of ignorance possible into economic models. And what I wanted to show is that even if you introduce just that much, that we have no, lo we have no longer any economic rationale for antitrust laws. If you introducing the search uh, theory uh, dissolves uh, the welfare conclusions from the competitive uh, model, of course, if you think of uh, uh, antitrust has buried the burden of proof, it sort of dissolves the case for antitrust. But if you go back a couple of centuries, it was uh, free trade that bore the burden of proof. What becomes of the invisible hand if you, if you dissolve uh, the analytical benchmark of the competitive model? Well, that, yeah, no, that, that, that's a good question. Well, it's not that you can't have market theory, it's that you, you, you can't justify uh, the market on purely purely economic grounds. Now, I, I see two possible avenues. If we want to throw out the conventional price theory justification, that is price equals marginal cost and all the optimality conditions, one is to try to develop a separate set of, of uh, criteria by which to judge performance that are purely economic. And the other, which is the view I take, is that we ought to, economists just ought to be open about the fact that we can't justify the market unless we want to make some kinds of ethical statements. And ultimately, the, 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 the justification for the market economy rests on ethics, not economics. to repeat that one because I'm, I'm not sure what it is. Could, could, you, could you repeat it? I'm not...
keep a word prior for a set of statements about the future. And perhaps there is that sense in which positive economic conclusions can be reached but are not necessarily ethical conclusions. I'm not sure how this sort of statement squares with the statement you just made. Okay, well, it, it, it doesn't square with, with my, my per personal opinion, but, but I did say that, that economists really have two avenues open to them. One is to try to develop a set of criteria which are, quote, positive, non-normative, that by which we can judge the market. And that, but the point is that criteria, can, or those, that criteria, those criteria cannot include price equaling marginal cost. But it may well be. Uh, I wouldn't want to discourage anyone from trying to develop uh, uh, a criterion by which to judge the market that is non non ethical. I think he would be better off under the second system. There's no such mm -hmm. Right. I think it's pretty clear. You wouldn't have IBM typewriters. You wouldn't have cars. You wouldn't have anything because no one would ever have had the incentive to think about it. The only inventions you have are things that just look like people. And then they couldn't do anything about it until they convinced other people to produce it at the same time so the price gets completely down to market price. You wouldn't have had the 20th century. The way it developed about the price of the market. So I think you can make some positive statements. And it's true you'd want to have some kind of more rigorous way of making specific comparisons. I think it's a pretty clear comparison without being any better. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a value judgment. This is the 20th century. Yeah. That's what he said. He said that you're making a value judgment in praising the 20th century. It, it strikes me from hearing uh, Dr. Lanois' uh, comments as well as some of the others that what we're leading to is a system of economic analysis that basically throws out most of the rules and that we come up with almost a judgmental ad hoc situation with each case. Uh, and the legal system tries to create some certainty for folks who operate within it uh, by creating rules. Are we getting to a situation where the antitrust laws are basically irrelevant to, uh, to the legal system and we can't use it anymore. The question, as best I understand, was whether the implication of what we've all said here is that, is that we've, we have to, in some sense, throw out all the rules of economics and sort of judge every case on its on, on an individual basis, okay, without some, some fixed rules because of the turmoil in the theory or, or whatever, and what does this say about antitrust? Is this the gist of what you were getting at? Well, it basically, it basically leads to so much uncertainty that, that lawyers right. have no way to apply what you're uh, right. espousing. Well, what I was saying was in some sense just the opposite. I was saying that formal theory is, is supposed to tell us what the rules are of antitrust, what you should look for, okay? And my contention was that because the formal theory was generated for, well, for a lot of, a lot of reasons, uh, economists have, gotten, have begun to use what I call the appreciative theory that's much different from the formal theory. And this appreciative theory generally consists of analyzing special cases on their merits, that we can't say in general that that uh, uh, such and such a market structure is bad. So let's look at the cost curves, let's get in, get the data, let's do this and see if this industry is, uh, is competitive or not. We'll make our own value judgments as good down-to-earth, nitty-gritty industrial organization economists, and that's what all good industrial organization economists do. They go in there and get cost curves and they make judgments about industries based on their experience and so on. And that's all case by case. And the reason it's case by case is because we don't have a theory that's, that's general. 
We don't have a theory that says we should do the following things about antitrust. And what I was saying is, is exactly the opposite of what you were, of what you were implying, is that, that well, why we want a better formal theory is, is exactly so we do have more predictability. That we say we want to, uh, maybe we'll want to have a theory that's based on, on uh, property rights. Okay, whether property rights allow entry or not. That would be sort of an Austrian property rights version. Or maybe we want to have a theory that says we will have certain rules about, about when markets, about what market structures, which market structures promote innovation and which ones don't. Okay, uh, but that's, that's a different theory. Um, and that's very different from what we have now. And I agree with you completely that what we need is, is more predictability in the, in the theory. Lawyers, not the economists. They're defending the case. They're not the prosecutor. Mm -hmm. But if they had to approach it like you're saying, various theories, then the theory is it all depends. And that's the best type of approach, I would think, from the standpoint of the lawyer. Because he can he can't get this theory, he can take this theory or this theory and end up winning his case. Yeah, the, the remark was that maybe it's better for the lawyers that there could be some indeterminacy in the theory, so that lawyers can adapt the theory to their needs. It's, it's not so much the lawyers as it is the businessmen who need, need predictability. We're going to let Mario give one minute to come I think this is an important question because in, in my uh, research into the economic aspects of other of areas of the law which I think make more sense than antitrust, like the tort, contract, evidence, et cetera, areas. Um, the importance of rules of thumb is, is quite evident, uh, that uh, courts are reluctant to have a, uh, a rule which is fine-tuned to each specific case, even at the risk that they will do the wrong thing in a particular case be, uh, for, for lack of fine-tuning it, they will still insist on a rule of thumb because it economizes on uh, time and the resources in, in, in ways which are economically very important. Um, but, for example, my recommendation that the, uh, the per se rule against price fixing be shifted uh, th to a rule of reason is just an interim suggestion. Ultimately, uh, what I would, would advocate is a strong presumption of legality in all cases of price fixing, put the burden of proof heavily on uh, those who claim that the price fixing is antisocial, with the consequence that probably very few situations would be found to be illegal, and the whole area of law would shrink down to almost zero, which I think is almost the optimum. Yeah, I'd like to do two things, uh, so don't run yet. I want to change the schedule slightly, and I want to take a 20-minute break instead of a half an hour and let us get out of here 10 minutes early, which I think, uh, since it's a Saturday afternoon, we might be in favor of. So there'll be coffee, I understand, in the next room again, and we can pursue the questions uh, you know, in that more informal setting. And then I'd like to thank the panel.